Scott Loveridge with the North Central Regional Center for Rural Development, and I'm your moderator for today's webinar. Uh, thanks for joining us today. We've got a great uh, topic here, I think. Um, just some, some basic ground rules for the webinar is uh, we do have a chat box here over at the left-hand side, so if you've got questions, we'll uh, take those uh, as they come throughout the webinar. I'll monitor that chat box, and as I see questions come in, I'll interrupt our speakers and, and make sure that those get addressed. Our two speakers are Todd Keithy and Jennifer Ift. Uh, Todd is an economist with the Farm and Rural Business Branch in the Resource and Ec Rural Economics Division of the USDA Economic Research Service. And Jennifer is an economist also with the Farm and Rural, uh, with the Farm and Rural Business Branch in the Resource and Rural Economics Division of USDA Economic Research Service. And with that, I think I'll turn it over to Todd, who's up first. It's all yours, Todd. Yes, thank you all for tuning in. Uh, there's a great set of speakers here, and I'm glad that we could be a part of it. Um, just to kind of jump in, uh, what we'll be discussing mostly today is uh, some of the results and findings of a report that Jenny and I contributed to that uh, ERS put out earlier this year. Um, we've also updated some of the numbers and figures um, with data that's been released either since the report was published or while we were in the process of doing so, and also incorporate some of the information from our broader research portfolio with respect to farmland values. Um, and Jenny also promised she's got some some new uh, little nuggets of information that'll be she's excited to share. Um, and, and also, if those of you are interested, at the very end, the last slide will have a links to some of those uh, uh, papers, and if you wanted to for the sort of suggested readings. But first, I want to start with a poll we have here this, uh, to ask what, how it best describes your profession. So we, I kind of like to get a feel for the audience here. And then whenever, uh, I don't know when we'll get to see the results here. Yeah, I could broadcast those. Yes, please. So it's mostly extension. Nice. Well, good. I'm glad to get some uh, some nice folks with some on-the-ground knowledge here. Um, take some of the burden off of me here. So if we'll move along here to the... So uh, just a brief outline. So it's about sort of why we study farmland values, um, why just sort of anyone in the sector is interested in farmland but also the USDA specifically. We'll talk about some of the recent trends and then also what are the important drivers of the current farmland markets. Um, a lot of economists like to use this term barometer, which I, I kind of uh, gravitate towards as well, because fa uh, farm real estate is such a huge section of our, of our sector's wealth. Um, and you can see here on this pane on the left-hand side of the slide, the share of farm assets. This is uh, numbers put, aggregate numbers put out by uh, by a group here at Economic Research Service, and shows that it's it's a significant part of farm assets. And in this uh, 2012 year, it's forecasted to be about 86 percent. Um, farmland also plays an important role for farm managers. Um, it's a major source of collateral for loans. There's a lot of discussion of transition issues and estate planning, uh, especially in the last couple weeks, even. Um, and then it's also, there's a big policy link, and that's an area that uh, Jenny and I have been pretty active in, that hopefully next time we can share some more stuff with you about the links to policy. But the reason everyone is so excited about farmland right now is this rapid appreciation that we're seeing, um, particularly in the Midwest, but throughout the country. Um, it gets a lot of national media coverage whenever a uh, group releases some forecasts. So here's a graph here of um, USDA data for farm real estate, which includes the value of buildings and structures in addition to what uh, kids uh, where I grew up uh, in Missouri, we all just say the ground. So, um, and it's plotted here in both real and inflation adjusted or, uh, or real inflation adjusted terms and also nominal values. Uh, for those that are interested, we uh, in, use a GDP deflator here, which is pretty common with a lot of the large macro estimates that ERS puts out. Um, and if you look, the part that we're really interested in is especially, oh, let me, these last few years where it's really shot up. Since 2005, the real annual average, the annual average price increase uh, for in real terms is about 6.7 percent. 
Um, that brings two important questions. So first is what's driving this uh, appreciation? And then the second is um, what's going to happen next, right? Is the question people like to ask, you know, is this the next 1980s? And what we mean by that is you can see here the last time we had a rapid appreciation in the late 70s. Um, from 75 to 80, to put it in context, 75 to 80 in real terms is about a 7.8% annual average increase. Uh, but then 81 to 85, uh, things sort of fell off and had about a 5.5% annual decrease. And so everyone's sort of worried about, you know, what's this, what's this part here look like going in the future? Um, but these appreciations also uh, increase the interest of market participants, traditional farmland, uh, buyers and um, and policy folks uh, but it's also increased a lot of outside interest um, and this is a chart here uh, version of uh, we put together with our intern Nick Walsh from George Washington University in studying uh, comparing how farmland compares to other investments it's a it's a popular topic um, Jenny and I put something out uh, through RE update um, last year also on this topic but what we have here to kind of walk you through this graph is we have the farm real estate values. Now, these are all going to be in nominal values, but it's from the previous graph we saw um, for farm real estate. And then uh, we have some other investment alternatives, the Moody's season uh, AAA corporate bond yield, the 10-year treasury maturity rate, the Dow Jones industrial average, and the S&P 500. These are just really simple annual percent change. Um, this isn't too too uh, complicated. Just try to keep it simple. You can see the picture here. Uh, the vertical axis is the mean return over two different periods. The left graph has from 1970 through 2011, and the right hand side is just focusing on the last 10 years, from 2000 to 2011. Um, so we have the mean return going vertically, and the standard deviation, so the variation in returns um, along the horizontal graph. So a lot of investors obviously you like to be up here uh, to get high returns um, and then if you're risk averse you try to get a little closer to this um, this axis here so you would try to find something that's high return and low risk and if you look at the picture for farmland you can see that that in a lot of ways has happened it's maintained a pretty high uh, uh, average return so from 1970 to 2011 uh, it was at 6.5%, but now at 7.4%. But where you see the really active is the other markets where uh, the financial markets, for example, where uh, the, they've remained the variability, but the, uh, the uh, re average return has gone down. So the next question naturally is sort of what is driving this uh, price appreciation? Um, so if we can have our next poll here, that would be fun to see what our audience thinks. Okay, and then while uh, they're doing that, maybe... Um Todd, you would be able to answer a couple of these questions that came in. One from Tim on uh, what are the farmland values based on? Is it actual transactions or is it appraised values? Yeah, the we actually the figures that we're showing here, and actually I believe throughout are based on uh, the USDA published values and also we have access to their survey which is a survey of farm operators um, it's conducted in June of every year it's called the June area survey um, and it's actually farm operators uh, reported market value so they ask what do you think is a fair market value for the land you have so it's based on a survey okay and that probably answers a little bit Steve Bracca's question too it's it's um, survey based so whatever they think its value is so they might they might be thinking of selling it for, um, you know, residential housing or something like that, right? Um, that's so what a good question. Whatever Jenny, the farmer oh, Jenny has. Can't hear. Yeah, it's, it's the farmer reported value, what they feel like it would sell for at the current market. So if they're sitting on the edge of a city, so. then it might be going to, to housing. So, uh, potentially, and, and Jenny actually a good thing you brought that up. Jenny's going to talk about that exact issue. So okay, good. Uh, but yeah, maybe we can see the results here. What everyone thinks. Okay, let's broadcast now. So um, mostly in the farm, farm income commodity price category. Nice. Well, that'll that'll make my uh, transition to the next slide a lot easier here if we'll move along. Um, 
when we talk about the, sort of the classical mar, uh, model of farmland, what are the major drivers? Uh, the first is obviously returns. Um, we think about it in terms of either cash renting the land or what you could make from producing farm goods and services on your own. Uh, but then also this idea of development potential or other uses for the land. Um, and then the next case is interest rates, uh, which shows us the time value of money, but also the opportunity cost for you know, the relatively uh, low risk investment alternatively. And you can see, and I'm sure it's no secret to most of our audience that farm incomes are going up and have been for quite a while. Uh, this is our, the ERS's uh, reports for, or aggregate values for estimated net cash income from 1990 through 2011 here with the dashed line. And then the real estate values, these are both in uh, real values um, that we've seen here a couple graphs before going up. Um, and I like to keep things really simple. Um, as possible when I can look at it and here's just a just a linear uh, fit through those points and you can see that they're both going up um, and at the same time the other thing we look at is interest rates and um, and again this here is the three-month Treasury rate uh, over the same period and you can see that it's fall uh, has fallen substantially and then actually in the last few years it's been close to zero in 2011 the the uh, data that I have reports it at 0 0.01, um, so exceptionally low. And to prove the point here again, that uh, like again, I like to keep it simple. You can see just uh, farmland prices are going up while interest rates are going down. Um, but a lot of the numbers I've talked to you about are these sort of big aggregate numbers that we report. Uh, but that hides a lot of the variation in farmland. Uh, for example, I had a I spoke with a, a gentleman this summer that said, well, where do you think the best market for farmland is? Do you think it's Iowa or Illinois, Indiana? And I said, yeah, I think all of it, right? So from a, from a big perspective, it's sort of all one market, but when you drill down, things get uh, a little more peculiar. So we're gonna, I'm going to show you a couple figures here uh, that are based on the NAS uh, production regions, which I've shown you here. And, uh, and this is, comes out of the First week of August, NAS releases their farm real estate and farmland value report. And two of the figures that they put out that are really interesting to me are crop and pasture land, which, again, this now is just the ground. It doesn't include buildings and structures. Um, but this gives you just some indication that even at this sort of bigger snapshot, um, there is a significant variation in land values. Um, for example, in the United States, the average value per acre uh, is $3,550 for cropland and $1,150 for pasture land. But if you look at the highest value cropland, it's not surprising, it kind of jumps out at you here, uh, is the Corn Belt, which has average value of about $6,000 an acre, whereas the Southern Plains, let's see if I can find them here, uh, is actually at the minimum at, at $1,600 an acre. So, I mean, there's, that's a very st uh, strong contrast. And the same is true with pasture land, where we find southeast values at $3,400 versus a mountain at $551. Um, so we're going to shift uh, courses, and I'll turn turn it over to Ginny, who will uh, drill down at even uh, finer uh, well, level to show you some really interesting maybe stuff. Maybe before oh. you do that, there's a question that came in from oh, okay. Bruce here about... Uh, land returns data and whether these are appreciation rates or do you have a current return as well? Uh, these actually I'm showing are just the appreciation rates. Um, so it doesn't include um, the uh, sort of what you'd say like sort of an active return. Okay, great. Well, Jenny's putting her headset on. Uh, if others have questions, this is a good time to input those. Okay. Hi, everybody. This is Jenny Ift. I'm going to start talking about non-agricultural drivers of farmland values. In this slide, we have the rent-to-value ratio for cropland and pasture. The rent-to-value ratio is a measure of returns to farmland, and it also contains information about the influence of non-agricultural non factors. It is a ratio of average cash rents to average land values at the national level. This ratio has been an overall decreasing trend for the past 50 years, but to give you some perspective, it did de decline in the late 70s and increase again in the early 80s. In this graph, we have the rent-to-value ratio from 1998. 
the cropland rent to value, which is the blue line, um, declined from about 5% to less than 4% in 2012. Pasture rent to value is substantially lower than for cropland and declined to around 1 in 2012. At the national level, the rent to value ratio reached its lowest point around 2007 and has increased marginally ever since. This indicates that rental rate increases have been commensurate with land value increases in recent years. The overall declining rent to value ratio is also indicative of non agricultural factors playing an increasingly large role in farmland values. Based on the rent to value ratio, non agricultural factors appear to play a larger role in pasture values than cropland values. Now we're going to talk about urban influence. Here we look at the share of farmland in urban influenced areas. For those who are interested, this chart uses ERS, Population Interaction Zones for Agriculture, or the PISA, to identify farmland that is urban influenced. There's been little change in the share of farmland under urban influence since 1999, with levels ranging from between 15 to 18 percent. It is interesting to note that the share of farmland in urban influenced areas reached its lowest point in 2006 and has increased slightly since. 2006 was the peak of the housing boom, and farm incomes have increased drastically from 2006. Next, we look at median cropland values in rural and urban influenced areas. Median cropland values for urban areas are indicated by the blue bars, and for rural areas by the red bars. The difference is noted by the green dashed line. We can easily see that cropland values in urban areas are significantly larger than cropland value in rural areas. This is related to development potential and amenities that urban areas offer. It is also possible that higher value agricultural production is closer, located closer to urban areas, which would put up, upwards pressure on farmland values. Although the difference between urban influence and rural cropland values has fluctuated since 1999, it is interesting to note that it is currently about at the same level as it was in 1999. This indicates that urban influence is not a driver of current increases in farmland values. Unless the current macroeconomic environment drastically changes, it is not likely that urban influence will increase in the near future. It sounds like they wanted to see that last map one more time, if you could flip back to that. We're, we're going to get to that, okay. so we'll get to it really shortly. Okay. We can see something similar when we look at average rural versus urban cropland and pasture values. Urban influence cropland and pasture values are the um, solid purple and blue lines. In urban influence areas, we can see the impact of the housing boom right here and the subsequent bust. Um, however, urban cropland and pasture values appear to be recovering or at least having a decli um, declining at a lower rate from 2010. Rural cropland and pasture values are indicated by the purple and blue dashed lines. Cropland and pasture values in these areas have been gradually and steadily increasing since 1999, while in recent years, real pasture values have been flat, or just basically increasing at the rate of inflation. I would like to briefly note that we use a different deflator here because we're pulling data from different reports. Next, what we'll do is we'll look at a series of maps that show the price to rent ratio for cropland from 1999 to 2011. This is a ratio of cropland market value to the capitalized value of cash rents. The capitalized value of cash rents is a measure of the current value of all future agricultural production. A high ratio indicates that non-agricultural factors have a large influence on land values, while lower ratios, lower ratios indicate that land values are more likely to be supported by farm income. So if you look here, the higher values are in blue and the lower values are in, are in brown. Just from this map, we can see that some urban areas have a large impact and others do not. 
as I go through the years, you'll see some local ch changes through 2011, but no dramatic regional shifts. And if we look here, we can see that some urban areas have a large impact while others do not. We can see large urban influence in Texas and also in the East Coast, Southern Pennsylvania, down through the Carolinas. Um, in Southern Georgia and, and perhaps in Tennessee, it's not clear that the high price to rent ratio is being driven by urban influence. And one thing you'll want to note as I go through these slides is you can see a decline of the price to rent ratio for the Midwest over time. Um, in these white areas, we have insufficient observations for disclosure. These are basically areas where there's also not a lot of agriculture, so not, there wasn't many survey observations. I move to 2000. Um, now that I've given you an overview, I'll go through all the years slowly. I believe the presentations are going to be posted online, so if you want to look at this in more detail, you can just go to the back to the website. 2001, 2002, 2003, 2004, and 2005, 2006, 2007, 2008, 2009, 2010, and 2011. Thank you for listening. Our contact information is here. We love to hear from you if you're interested in further dis discussing any of the information we've presented here. In this last slide, we have various publications that we've, oh, great. we've worked Thanks on a lot. at ERS, and Jenny we look forward to is, uh, any questions you might have. An excellent have. overview of, of an important resource um, for our rural areas. Um, it's, uh, it was interesting watching that last set of slides where you're scrolling through the different years. Um, how rapidly that um, things kind of change back and forth. Um, what what do you think's going on there with the, those rapid changes? Is it just is it just crop prices or what is it? Um. Well, you've seen the land values increased dramatically in some of these areas. In some cases, rents may or may not have changed, may or may not have changed a lot. But if you say, look at the East Coast, if we go back, those areas are still relatively dark blue. And if you look at the, at Texas also, those areas are still showing a lot of, a lot of urban influence. It does look like it's decreasing in the Midwest over time, which could be Dude, um, one of the explanations could be that the housing boom and bust. Um, also, we're we're drawing from different survey years, so that could could play a role when the when the sample changes. But it does appear to be fairly consistent over time in the areas that have relatively higher levels of non-agricultural. Yeah, do you think it's also influence. maybe an expectation of um, higher prices for grains that's going on in the the area that you're you got the pointer on right now? I think, I mean, if the, to the degree there are higher expectations for grain, that's definitely yeah, going to be increasing it, it could be, farmland well, values, but it could also lead to rents now, going up. But so. We're expecting it to be higher over the long haul with uh, the various things that are going on in, internationally. Well, I guess it's a, if it's yeah, a that, long that information would How be contained in both be? values and rents to some degree. Um, I think it varies. It varies quite a bit. You have annual contracts, long-term contracts. I think farm. There's a question that came in here from Ron that about actually, the percentage of farmland owned they might by have absentee some insight. owners, and has that changed? Um, and what and does that vary by region? And and what about proximity to urban areas? I haven't seen the data for that, Todd. The what? Um, this question here. Do you want to? I'm going to pass along to Todd. 
Yeah, so we had a little glitch today, so we're passing the headset back and forth. Um, as far as the absentee owners, unfortunately, that's a, a population that we uh, don't have a lot of information on. Um, I, it's, so it's really tough to speculate. Um, the USDA just currently hasn't uh, been able to survey on that uh, topic for a while, so um, I wish I could tell you more about it. But well, it certainly is an issue that is coming up a lot in, in, in my way, conversations I that I sit in on is uh, this concern that they're, you know, the, the rural areas are, are becoming, um, you know, as uh, farm owners um, get out of farming and, and farms are consolidated and, uh, and the children move to the cities, um, you know, they, they may be continue to own the property but not live there and so then they're, they're taking rents off without uh, really actively managing it and, and sort of funneling wealth out of the rural areas. So it, um, it, it would be worthwhile doing some exploration uh, related to that. I think that would, uh, would be a topic of interest to, uh, to folks. So if you've got data that can deal with it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. That's the tough. It's that's it's a tough group to uh, identify and and nail down and uh, and and be able to ask questions. Uh, but yeah, I mean that's definitely a um, a big concern, and I I also hear it from the folks that we talk to. Yeah, you guys are. Um, so you guys have access to the. I don't know. Hopefully that that's a good uh, uh, charge yeah, for us. Good data forward, with. I guess. You know, it's not aggregated, so you can look into it. Look into it a little bit more than us people on the outside. So. Um, good thing for you to be checking out. Are there other questions here? If not, um, or if you're as you're thinking of questions, we we do have a little uh, summary evaluation poll for participants, uh, and it just disappeared. Where to go? Oh, uh, there it is. So if you folks could fill that out, that would be great. What do you guys see yourselves doing next on, on the, these topics moving forward? Well, uh, that's a good question. We have uh, a couple of papers in process and in review that um, Jenny's uh, particularly been driving uh, through the process on uh, the link between policy and, uh, and farmland prices. So to what degree there is this capitalization effect where um, the uh, supported incomes or, or uh, risk management will drive up uh, or be incorporated into the prices uh, people are willing to pay for that. Um, and then um, the, uh, we're also looking at uh, this idea of a thinness effect. Um, and so, you know, farmland markets are notoriously thin, a lot of very few transactions. So we're trying to do that. And Jenny's writing notes to me here. Um. Oh, oh, to the question. Yeah, we uh, to go to Tim's question. Uh, Jenny's uh, translating to me here that um, our data show that the total cropland acres, um, in terms of acres operated, have not changed drastically. Um, a little bit, but in terms of the, it's sort of the big aggregate level that we look at at the USDA have, hasn't seen a lot of change. Um, and then, um, oh, uh, yeah, timberland also was excluded in the in the data that we've been uh, working with that we used to draw this here. So it's, that's uh, why you have the limited to uh, sort of crops the big, and pastures. Big white areas up here in the northern Michigan, and, uh, northern Wisconsin, and and uh, northern Minnesota. Correct. My area. Yep, that makes sense. Um, so okay, well, great. It's. Uh, it looks like folks have uh, finished their doing their evaluation, and I'm not seeing a lot of more questions coming in on the chat box. So I want to thank both of you for taking a few minutes to go over your study, and you know I think it's a useful one and, and helpful in thinking about uh, what's going on in, in our rural areas.
Well, uh, on behalf of Jenny and me, thank you very much for your time, uh, both uh, Scott and Rosa, who set this up, and everyone that could uh, participate today. And All right. if you very have good. any 